Welcome back to another video this is a part 6 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 21, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 21, The Contract. Scene, Occult Research Club Room. I don't want to hear any more nonsense about ghosts and such. Rias, you are just trying to weasel your way out of your punishment. Graphia, who is currently sitting at Rias's desk, crosses her legs while tightening her brows as she glares at Rias. Rias then begins to stomp her feet down in anger. No, that's not true. Graphia, I swear that there was something in that bathroom. Rias then whispers in a frightened voice. It called me by my name. Graphia's internal thoughts were that of absolute joy, however she continued to maintain her act. Rias, either you get back to work or I am going to add another 12 hours to your penance. Scene, Yasaka Castle. Near the entrance way of the castle, we can see Issei along with Sona's peerage and Seraphal. Each of the girls were wearing their own individual kimonos as Saji and Issei were wearing matching black yukatas. Sona was wearing a purple and white garb along with a blue butterfly which adorned the majority of her back. Meanwhile, her older sister was wearing a dark blue kimono which had a white sash with what looked like flowers or blossoms at a distance, but at further glance, they were actually the blue symbols of the house of Citri. Unlike usual, Seraphal had her jet black hair put down in a single braid, rather than her trademark twin tails. She looked quite elegant though her mannerisms were still that of an excited, milky chan, to Issei enjoyment. Momo and Ruruko were giving each other the stink eye as both girls looked to have accidentally purchased the same color and design in their kimonos, down to the sash color. Red and white were the colors while the sashes were gold. Rea was wearing a black with gray garb as Subasa had a green one with an orange sash. Tomo was wearing a pink color along with a purple sash. Subaki was wearing a teal kimono along with a black sash. On the vice president's head was a jade hair pick. It was shaped like a panda bear but the color matched Tsubaki's outfit. Seraphal points toward Tsubaki. All right navigator, take us to the first destination planned on our adventure. Then, the Mao runs toward Issei while grabbing his arm and holding onto it with both of hers. Onward, Momo sees this while looking over toward Saji. Ruruko also sees this and looks toward Saji. Then both girls scowl at one another as they each dart for the other male of the group. Instantly, Saji is being tugged on by both of his arms by each of the girls as they fight over him. Sona decides to discreetly take hold of Issei's other hand while the peerage was distracted by Momo and Ruruko's antics. Looking at both Seraphal and then Sona, Issei couldn't help but feel like he was on top of the world once again. Time skip, 6 hours. It was indeed a long day in Kyoto, there was much to see. As the peerage made its way back into Yusaka's castle, each of them were showing off their newly acquired souvenirs to one another. Not only did they hit up all of the tourist traps, but they also managed to visit a few of Kyoto's landmarks before heading back. All in all, everyone in the group had a great time, aside from a bit of bickering from a few of the girls, mainly involving Issei or Saji. After everyone settled down, Issei looked out from the window in the guest room. He was relaxing on the futon bed while doing absolutely nothing. His feet were aching from all of the walking around and it felt good to just lay around for a change. Seeing that the sun was finally setting, Issei took a deep breath and stood up. Remembering that Sona and the girls went down to the baths, Issei thought better to simply get on with his contract and not. Cause a fuss. Once he was at the entrance way of the castle, Issei began to put on his shoes. As he was sitting on the stone slab, a hand touched his shoulder. Flinching, Issei turned a bit only to see Seraphal. She was wearing nothing but a towel and sandals. Issei turned around immediately. Oh hello, Milky Chan. You scared me there for a sec, hey. Seraphal then proceeded to walk around and stand directly in front of Issei. Having to now look up, as he was still sitting, Issei met with Seraphal's blue eyes. Issei-kun, were you about to just leave and not tell anyone? No no. That's a bad boy, Issei-kun. You need to tell your favorite idol when you are leaving on your contract, yup yup, that's right. Issei tilts his head, well, I didn't want to bother you guys as you were taking baths and stuff. Seraphal now smiles warmly, Issei, were you having naughty thoughts about us girls back up in your room just now? 
It's all right. You can tell me. Realizing that Seraphal might be trying to mess with him, Issei proceeds to stand up. Look, I really need to get going. The contract said sunset. Well, it's sunset. So, Ern, Issei was very apprehensive about what he was going to do next, but she did say that they are boyfriend and girlfriend, so either kiss me goodbye or come along, either is fine with me. Partner, wow, I will say this, you have some serious balls, speaking to Seraphal Leviathan like that. Dedrag was wondering who this kid was and what happened to Issei Hyodo. Can it? Issei internally retorts and then looks back at Seraphal, hoping very much that she won't destroy him. To his surprise, Seraphal was blushing intensely. Issei. Just for that, allow me to retaliate accordingly. Seraphal then shows an evil grin. As Issei is about to raise his hands to try and minimize whatever damage Seraphal was planning to inflict, instead, something else happened. Seraphal releases her towel. Then she watches Issei squirm as her grin continues. Meanwhile, she slowly makes her way closer toward the sitting team, who is now trying to back away as his eyes are glued shut. Then, Issei feels lips against his, only to open his eyes and see Seraphal's blue ones. After a moment or two, Seraphal then releases the kiss as she stands all the way back up. Now seeing Issei's intense blush, the Mao felt as though she got the last word in all of this. Reaching for her towel, in a pose that was completely intentional, the Mao then re-wraps her towel and begins to make her way back into the home as she quickly rubs Issei's hair on her way through the main entrance. Instantly, Issei's dreamy smile now turned into a grin of his own. See, Dedrag, she's my girlfriend. Even though she can destroy heaven and earth, in the end, she's my girlfriend. Milky Chan is my girlfriend. I can't get over it. Yeah yeah, shut your hole. The drag internally scoffs. Scene, the Thousand Kyoto Hotel. Issei walked toward the address that was printed on his contract pamphlet and realized that this was a really high-end place. Wondering what his client could possibly want from him, the teen made his way through the rotating doors while he still wore his black yukata from earlier that day. He was glad he didn't change into his casual attire or rather, Saji's. Once in the elevator, Issei pressed the button for the level of his desired room. After leaving the elevator, the teen walked through the long hallway, until he found the room number that matched the one on his pamphlet. Lo and behold, room 217. Stuffing his contract into his yukata, Issei was about to knock, that was until the door suddenly opened. Peeking through the door was an older man. He looked as if he needed a shave, aside from that, he had black hair with blonde in the front and it was very messy. His violet eyes were trained on the teen as the man began to show a small smirk. Issei nervously waved. The strange man then spoke in a whisper as he was now creaking his head out from his room while looking to the left and right. Pissed, say, kid, are you, you know, a devil? Issei nods nervously. Yeah, I mean, you put my name on my contract, so, I thought. Without a second's notice, Issei found two strong hands gripping his shoulders as he was instantly pulled into the room. Shortly after, the door slams shut along with the sounds of locking. Meanwhile, Issei finds himself sitting on the floor as the strange man looks to be staring through the peephole of the door. Yeah, I know who you are, kid. Sorry about the strange situation, but I had this feeling that somebody or something might have been following you. But, from the looks of it, I think I might have been wrong about that good thing now the man turns around and smiles nervously while scratching the back of his head so you can call me azzy hyodo issei seen yasaka castle i will admit president i think perhaps we should invest in a bathhouse similar to yasaka sama's tsubaki had a look of all-out seriousness as she walked beside sona both girls were walking in bath towels as they continued on throughout the hallways it's not healthy to confuse luxury with practicality, Tsubaki. Sona had her usual stoic features as she continued her way back to her room. Then, Sona noticed that it was dark outside as she passed a few windows. Tsubaki, Issei's contract. Both girls were now running toward Sona's room only to burst open the sliding door and see the room was unoccupied. Shit, Sona facepalmed. Seen Azzy's hotel room. So, kid, can I get you anything to drink? I've got sake. Azzy was now rummaging through his mini-fridge. 
Sitting on a large couch and looking at a giant TV with Smash Bros on pause, Issei looked back at his client. Nah, I'm underage, I shouldn't drink yet, even if I'm a devil. Well, aside from sake, I can offer you water. As he pulls a bottled water from his fridge, Issei nods while shortly receiving the water as the man tossed it toward him. Issei thought for a moment and then spoke up. So, did you summon me just to play video games with you? That sounds a bit, well, strange, if you don't mind me saying so. I mean, you are the client, the customer and I guess the customer is always right hee hee. Sitting back down on the couch while placing his sake down on the coffee table, the man now grabs his Joy-Cons and unpauses the game. And what of it, let's just say that I'm bored and I thought it might be rather interesting to play video games with a bona fide devil. Issei nods while flinching as he manages to block one of Azzy's attacks within the game. Well, I hope you don't get too upset when I relentlessly spank you with this. See, right there, you're making a huge mistake if you think I'll fall for that a second time. Ha ha ha, now you're mashing the buttons, bro, stop having a noob fit. After another 45 minutes, the man known as Azzy looked rather agitated. His entire bottle of sake was now gone. His agitation was due to Issei's proclamation and more so, Issei acting on that proclamation and going after Azzy with extreme prejudice. He lost each and every battle. Finally, having had enough, he stood from the couch as he marched toward a closed door within the room. Pounding on the door, the man known as Azzy began to yell a few words. Valley. Get your pale ass out here. I've found someone who is much better than you are, at Smash that is. The door flies open revealing a younger man with wild looking white hair along with hazel eyes. He was wearing a simple white t-shirt along with grey sweatpants. He was looking past Azzy and drilling. His piercing gaze into this boy with intent to destroy. Now pointing toward Issei, the white haired younger man speaks with a bit of ferocity. Just know one thing, edge guarding will not help you. Issei smiles nervously, all right, bring it, dude. Scene, rooftop of the Thousand Kyoto Hotel. Milky Chan will save the day. Milky Chan is here to stay. La, la, la. Dancing along the roof panels was none other than Seraphal Leviathan. She was wearing her milky spiral outfit once again as she looked to be wearing a pink pair of headphones that doubled as Nekomimi, cat ears. As Seraphal continued to dance to her own theme songs, she was looking at her phone. On the display, we can see what looks to be a police camera view, showing her what Issei was doing. As she continued to watch Issei struggle against his new opponent, the Mao continued to dance and sing even louder. Chapter 22, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 22, The Problems with Priests. Scene, The Thousand Kyoto Hotel. Stop doing that, no, no, you are clearly cheating, wah. Winner Bayonetta, the once mentioned Valley now tossed his Joy-Cons toward the floor while standing from the couch. He now stood directly in front of the television as his white bangs covered his eyes. I who am about to awaken. As he immediately jumps from his side of the couch and grabs the white-haired young man by his arm as he opens the front door that leads to the hotel hallway. Whoa there, killer, calm down. Here, take this wad of yen and take your pain and frustrations out down in the arcade. Right after the confused valley had some money thrown at him, the door was slammed shut. Now grinding his teeth, the white-haired man stomped down the hallways and toward the elevators. Hyodo Issei is it, well, I'll get you back, Red Dragon Emperor, valley was pounding on the elevator panel as he continued to grimace. As Azzy turned around while looking at an equally confused Issei, he simply smiled. Haha, yeah, don't mind him, he is kind of sensitive. He's my nephew, kinda. Nodding Issei takes a large gulp from his water bottle. Ehim, so um, did you want to continue to play games or what? Sitting back down on the couch after retrieving a fresh bottle of sake from his mini fridge, Azzy replies. Truth be told, kid, I actually summoned you here for a completely different reason. See, I know that you are this generation's security and I can't help but find you rather fascinating. Before Issei had a chance to even ask what this guy was talking about, a loud pounding could be heard from the main door. Bang 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 Issei and Azzy both stood up. While this was happening, a dark and violet color seemed to take over the entire room. Azzy spoke up, shit, 
You were followed after all. They put up a barrier too. Interesting, very interesting. The middle-aged man began to smirk. Hearing this, Issei stood in front of Azzy. Stay behind me, I'll protect you. I am a devil after all. Boosted gear, boosted gear. Issei's arm was enveloped in crimson and emerald light. Flash, Issei's arm was now clad in his signature clawed and red gauntlet. Issei then looked toward the door as it began to smoke. Boost, boost. The door completely vaporized in smoldering purple flames. Walking through the smoke were three individuals. Two of them were wearing black robes with hoods over their faces while the third one was a white-haired female. She wore what looked to be some kind of assassin outfit, black in color with multiple pocket-like attachments. She had very stern and red-colored eyes. Issei was too focused on protecting his human client to notice that this woman had a well-developed figure. Her body was comparable to that of Issei's, now official, girlfriend, Sona. C3. Boost. Boost. The woman was brandishing a flaming sword which was the color of purple. Issei got some serious vibes that felt eerily familiar. The woman now pointed her sword toward Issei. Boost. Boost. Once this happened, one of the individuals in black cloaks spoke up. Prepare yourself, devil, for we are the ones that will end your insufferable existence. And you, the pathetic excuse for God's child, summoning a spawn of Satan, how dare you? For your sins, you will also suffer the wrath of our righteous cause. Issei began to laugh while he maintained a confident smirk. Yeah, I've dealt with assholes like you. self righteous fucks who think their shit doesn't sink. No more words, come at me. And remember, with feeling this time, boost boost instantly issei leapt toward the cloaked figure that was talking shit with a swift punch to his face followed up by a kick to his ribs the hooded man flew out of the hotel room and into the hallway wall smashing into it with such force that his entire body exploded in a mass of gore and viscera boost boost issei turned his attention toward the other cloaked figure who was now brandishing a light sword very similar to the ones that those exorcists used back at the church the teen took a quick glance over toward his client. Strangely the middle-aged man was smiling intensely. He didn't look the least bit frightened of his situation. Dodging a swing from the stray exorcist, Issei was turned his attention back onto his enemy. You won't like this, ass hat. Boost, boost. Issei used his gauntlet to block another attack from the lightsword as it hissed and burned against the crimson armor. While continuing this blocking, he used his other hand to punch the exorcist directly into his stomach. Coughing up quite a deal of blood, Issei proceeded to then grab the lightsword from the distracted man's hand. Once he got a hold of it, he pressed the button on the bottom which disengaged the exorcist's weapon. In the middle of his coughing fit, the hooded man found himself being head-butted. The action from this attack causes the exorcist to fly into the floor at unbelievable speed. Cracking his skull, the man was clearly dead. The middle-aged man known as Azzy, noticed that the white-haired girl had a strange weapon which got his attention. Looking toward Issei and now, this female invader, the older man grew a worried frown. He was pretty sure this purple and fiery sword was a sacred gear, more so, he didn't want to know what would happen if the security were to deal with that specific weapon, this early on. Issei was looking toward this strange woman now. She looked back at him with little emotion. Then she pointed her sword once again, toward the team. Issei squared up and prepared for his own attack. Then, from behind the woman, looking toward his client, something happened. Twelve very large and very black wings erupt from, Aziz, back. Before he was able to process anything, Lint also turned around as her emotionless eyes widened. To Issei's surprise, the woman's weapon vanished as she got on her knees while facing this fallen angel. Issei thought, fallen angel, as his teeth began to chitter. The white-haired woman spoke in a calm and collected manner. Greetings, Azazel Sama, I am Lint, I am an agent for Heaven's faction. My cover has now been blown. I therefore submit myself within your custody. The now known Azazel lowers his wings and scratches the back of his head while smiling. Oh come now, stand up, I'm not into that whole lord stuff. I heard about you, no worries. I'll take you back to Grigori with me the moment I finish. Azazel immediately dodges a clawed attack to his face from Issei with a look of complete shock. Boost, 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 boost. 
As Azazel was mildly struggling to avoid Issei's attacks, he couldn't help but wonder what was going on with the kid all of a sudden. Did he just snap or something? Unknown to Azazel or anyone really, Issei was seeing only the color of red. He didn't even see the man he was attacking, no, he only saw the phantom that was Rainier. She was smiling at him while showing off her sharp bite. As this was happening, Azazel was able to hear another voice coming from Issei's gauntlet. Partner, stop, partner, can you hear me? It's not her. Lint didn't know what to do at this point as she stood from her prostrated position. So, she simply watched the scene play out. At some point, Azazel was able to grab and hold onto both of Issei's arms with each of his hands. It was becoming harder and harder for the ancient angel. Maybe I should have kept Valley here. Shit, calm down kid. Issei Kun, Issei Kun, running through the broken entrance way was Seraphal. She had a very panicked look on her face. Seeing the governor of the fallen angels, struggling to stop a clearly hallucinating Issei from killing him, Seraphal ran to Issei back. I've got him, Azazel San. You can let go. Apprehensive at first, Azazel released his grip while he cringed. True to her word, Seraphal indeed, got him, as she looked to be pulling Issei away with one arm wrapped around his stomach. Meanwhile, Issei continued to claw and punch wildly toward Azazel's direction. His eyes had nothing but rage, revenge and bloodlust. Seraphal looks at Azazel with a very serious glance. Put those away for fuck's sake. Not quite getting it, the fallen governor does as asked. He then continues to watch the scene play out. Lint is also very confused, especially since this other devil had just arrived. Not just that, she was clearly powerful. Though Lin thought her outfit looked silly. Pulling the struggling and out of control Issei back toward the couch, the teen continued to scream the words, boost. Though, it looked as if Dedrag himself had intervened as no further acknowledgements of said boost were repeated. We now see Issei, on his back, being held down by his wrists as Seraphal straddles his midsection. Lint and Azazel both tilt their heads while their questioning glances intensify. Issei, 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 wake up, sweetheart, it's okay, that's not who you think it is. Shish, Seraphal, while still holding the teen down, lowers her face into Issei's chest. It's okay, I'm here now, I'm here now, shish there, yes, calm down, it's fine. Issei's legs and arms begin to relax a bit as his struggling turns into nothing more than random jerks at this point. Issei's eyes begin to lose their bloodlust as his eyelids begin to feel heavy. Dedrag then speaks up. Time to rest, partner. Reset. Issei's gear turns into red dust as his eyes now roll back while his lids close completely. Seraphal then releases the teen's arms and proceeds to lay on top of him with her head against his chest. That's my good Issei-kun. Seraphal then smiles while closing her eyes for a moment. Azazel puts a hand toward his chin while trying to comprehend what he had just witnessed. So, the brat is involved with Seraphal Leviathan. How incredibly interesting. Also, who on earth did he think I was? Well, Seraphal did tell me to put away my wings, so something must have happened that I don't know about. I wonder, this Hyodo kid is indeed very interesting, gonna keep an eye on you from now on, that's for damn sure. Chapter 23, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 23, Aftermath. Scene, Azazel's hotel room, Kyoto. Lint looks around the room as she now begins to close her eyes. Purple flames jet out from both of her shoulders, two of them exactly, both shaped. Like crosses, as Azazel and Seraphal both lift eyebrows at the same time. These jets of flame completely devour both of the bodies of the hooded figures, leaving only ash behind. Before another action could take place, the dimly colored and violet aura that lingered around the entire area, began to dissipate. This meant that the barrier was now beginning to lift and disappear. Once this happened, the broken door and all of the other collateral damage was completely restored to its original and intact form. Lint then opens her red eyes as she begins to bow to both Seraphal, who is still laying on Issei's chest, and the governor. I apologize for the trouble earlier. Again, as I explained earlier, I was working as a double agent for Heaven's faction, specifically for Lord Michael himself. However, the two stray exorcists that I was assigned to, well, they got track of this Hyodo Issei. He was spotted earlier when my team 
approached the north end area of the Five Star District. Once it was confirmed that he was indeed a devil, the other two thought it would be a good idea to follow him here. Afterwards, the plan was to dispatch the two of you. Regardless of how it might have looked, I wasn't going to go as far as to kill an innocent human, let alone risking a war by killing a devil. So, my thoughts were to find out if this devil was strong enough to kill the exorcists, if not, then I would have stepped in, either way, their fate was sealed the moment they chose to act. Azazel smiles as he searches his yukata for his package of cigarettes. Well, thanks for cleaning up the place. I can only imagine the invoice after everything happened, haha. <laughs> Lint Selzen, you don't need to explain. Remember, we are all on the same page right? In the end, it's about getting the three biblical factions to make peace once and for all. Azazel then turns over toward a sadly happy Seraphal. She has a depressing smile however she continues to lay peacefully on her boyfriend's sleeping chest. Continuing, Azazel clears his throat. Isn't that right, Mao Seraphal Leviathan? Moving her blue eyes from Lin to Azazel, the little Seraphal, wearing her magical girl costume, smiles just a bit brighter while nodding into Issei's chest. Uh huh, that's right. I want a safer world for my Satan. It's time that we all settle our differences. Seraphal then looks up to Issei's sleeping face and nods. Isn't that right, my cute little Issei kun? Azazel looks at Lint and she returns the stare. Then the two look back at the couple for a moment before tilting their heads at the same time. Azazel was about to say something, that was until someone barged into the hotel room door. What happened? I was playing Street Fighter downstairs and then I felt this power. Albon kept screaming at me, something about, the red one, the red one, so I know it involves that Hyoto kid, and I had a really high score with Vega and it was ruined then, wait, Valley now stopped moving while he stared at the strange scene that lay in front of him. Now joining in with Azazel and Lint, Valley begins to tilt his head. After another moment, Valley asks a question. Hey, Azazel, isn't that Seraphal Leviathan? Lighting a cigarette, Azazel simply nods. Yep, Valley now nods as his confusion deepens. So, let me get this straight, Seraphal Leviathan is lying on that Hyodo kid. Taking a deep puff, Azazel nods once again. Yep, Valley tilts his head the other way. I don't understand. No, this does not add up. What is going on here? I must be going crazy. Lint then speaks up. Yep, Valley turns around. Seeing this strange girl with red eyes, the equally white-colored haired man points at her with an accusing scowl. And who the hell is this? Scene, Kuo Academy. Relax girl, you got this, remember. What Grafia said. There's no ghosts, it's all in my head. Besides, after I am through with Hell Week, I'll get to see my Issei again. That's right, just think about him. Wait, why am I talking to myself? Rias, who was currently working the large polishing machine as she proceeded down one of the many of the Academy's large hallways, the Grimori heiress noticed a pungent and foul odor. Turning off the polishing machine, Rias begins to notice that the smell is coming from one of the bathrooms that she cleaned earlier. Getting a very bad feeling, the redhead pulls back both of her sleeves. Ema devil, I am certainly not afraid of some ghost, if anything, it should be afraid of me. Feeling confident yet still internally frightened, Rias began to approach the bathrooms with a forced grin. Kicking the girl's bathroom door open, Rias wanted to show who was in charge, just in case there really was a ghost. Oi, name is Rias Grimori, you might have heard of me. I don't care how scary you think you are because I am a devil. That's right, don't mess with me, bitch. Rias then flinches while waiting for any sounds or replies. After a few moments, Rias's grin returns. Then she slowly walks toward the stalls to investigate this awful smell. Sure enough, something was in each toilet bowl. What looked to be a mixture of rotting eggs, pieces of dead fish parts and a plethora of other unpleasant things, were overflowing out from each stall. It looked as though these items were forcefully flushed which led to a backup. Half of the bathroom was now flooded by this mixture of god-awful muck. And if that wasn't bad enough, Rias heard a noise from behind her. It was that same deep and unearthly voice. Rias oh Rias, ha 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 ha. The switch princess had her entire red head of hair fly upward as she darted from the bathroom. Running as quickly as her legs could carry her, Rias searched for Grafia while hysterically crying. Grafia, 
The ghost is real. It trashed the bathroom. This is unacceptable. Rias. Rias. Ah. Rias is in full panic mode. I hate this. I hate this so much. Scene, Yasaka Castle. As the front doors open, a frowning Seraphal comes walking in with a passed out Issei over her shoulder. Yasaka and Kuno were waiting at the door, both with very worried look on their faces. Moments ago, the Fox Queen received a telecommunication message that let her know Seraphal would be back with Issei from his contract duties. What she didn't know was that Issei was going to arrive at her home a second time while being unconscious. Yasaka then snaps her fingers as two of her masked guards arrive. As they bow toward their queen while awaiting orders, Yasaka speaks in a voice that carries much authority behind it. Take this child down to the baths, I'll be down momentarily. Seraphal allows the two guards to carefully take hold of the teen by both of his arms. After she watches him being taken away, the Mao has her smile return. Thank you, ladies. Hello Yasaka-chan and little Kuno. Phew, that was a knife. I think I taught myself a few new dance moves that I might incorporate in my upcoming Milky Spiral series. Yay me. Yasaka now begins to smile as does her daughter. Placing her sleeve over her mouth, the Fox Queen speaks. Era era. Well, now that you've done your part, I suppose I'll do mine. Seraphal then loses her smile while looking back toward Yasaka. He attacked the governor of the fallen angels, mind you, he was provoked by other circumstances. He thought he was fighting that Rainier person. I had to pull him back. I was thoroughly worried for him, Yasaka-chan. Seraphal's large and blue eyes began to tear up. Seeing this, Yasaka approaches Seraphal and proceeds to give her a hug. Era era. Don't worry Sarah chan All will be well. You came to the right place after all. I can help. Seraphal begins to nod rapidly in Yasaka's shoulder. It would devastate my Satan if something happened to him. No. No, I want Issei to be happy. He said that he sees me as a woman, Yasaka-chan, not some super devil like everyone else. He sees me as his Milky-chan and nothing else. He's a good, good boy. All right, all right, there there, I know, I know. It's all going to be fine. You just let me handle this part. For now, how about you go with Kuno and get something warm to drink, you'll feel much better. Yasaka now slowly released her friend while reaching for her daughter's hand and putting it in Seraphal's. Kuno, please tend to our very important Sarah Chan. Nodding, the little fox girl leads a whimpering but smiling Seraphal further into the home. Yasaka then thinks deeply as she is left alone in the walkway at the entrance. Perhaps I need to dig deeper tonight. Very well. Can't be helped I suppose, era era. Scene, Issei's mind. We see a repeat of a specific point in Issei's past. First, we flash toward a cafe. There, we see a questionably dressed Issei Hyodo sitting across from Yuma Amano. Both are enjoying the desert drinks. Each of them had smiles on their faces as each seemed truly happy. We flash again, this time we see Issei handing Yuma a purple bracelet. Again, the two seem very happy. The final flash is Issei, laying on the ground in a pool of his own blood. He is in pain, it hurts, it hurts so much, and there she is, mocking him as he slowly dies. Black wings, black feathers, black. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Issei's eyes open suddenly, tears were pouring from his eyes. Wiping his face, he noticed his hands were soaked with water. Breathing deeply in and out, the teen had no idea where he was. Barely able to comprehend his surroundings, Issei was only able to feel the sensation of being both wet and warm. Then the sounds of a bamboo shoot style fountain making a lock sound got the teen's attention as steam seemed to overwhelm the entire room. Then as Issei got a better look as his eyes adjusted, a person came into the room and threw the steam. Not only did the teen find himself sitting very comfortably in a large and hot tub, but none other than Yasaka of Kyoto was slowly dipping her bare foot into the water, just across from him. She was wearing nothing but a bath towel as her hair was held up by yet another towel. She was also wearing her signature crescent moon smile. Era era. Good evening, Issei-kun. Would you mind telling me if you think the water is too hot? Yasaka was now slightly blushing as Issei was completely gobsmacked. Before he knew it, Yasaka unraveled her towel as she slowly stepped into the hot tub. Issei was seeing everything as his eyes were now practically bulging from his sockets. Partner. 
I can now die peacefully knowing that I have seen heaven. Once in the large tub, Yasaka chooses to continue to shuffle her way through the deep water and make her way toward Issei's location. Once touching shoulders, Yasaka lays back. Ah, yes, I think you may be right, this water isn't too hot at all. Oh this feels wonderful on my back, it really is the best way to relieve stress, both physical and spiritual, hot baths that is. Um, yes indeed, Yasaka was now closing her eyes as she looked to be enjoying the relaxation of the baths. Issei just stayed where he was, frozen in the hot water. Not knowing what was happening, the team tried to recollect his last moments before blacking out. Then, Issei's eyes left Yasaka's amazing body as a memory came to him. He was now staring off into the steam as his face began to show a slight scowl. That client of mine, he turned into, into, Issei now had a look of sheer horror as this thought began to fester rather quickly. Yasaka opens one eye, she then begins to frown a bit. I apologize for this Issei, but I cannot allow you to go, there, anymore. Hearing this, Issei's thoughts are now interrupted as his attention is back on Yasaka. He still maintains his worried scowl. What? Yasaka then begins to hum in a very soft voice. Now closing her one eye, she grows a sad smile and continues to hum. It was a tune that Issei knew but didn't know. One fact was certain however, this simple action caused something to happen. Another memory flashed quickly into the teen's head. It was that grassy field from his dream the night before. As Yusaka continued to hum her tune, she then opened her one eye once more, while focusing on Issei's reaction. Issei had thoughts of a great and yellow beast. It destroyed the cause of his pain that evening. But it was hazy, Issei couldn't get a good look at it. For him, it was just a shapeless blur of yellow. Aside from the blue fire it emitted, everything else about it remains a complete mystery, that was until Yusaka's song was heard. Though there were no words, the melody was clear, it sounded as if the musical notes themselves were created by nature herself. Issei's eyes widened in realization. It was you. Yasaka now opens her other eye and turns her head while looking deeply into Issei's watery, warm and brown eyes. I won't let her hurt you anymore, Issei-kun. Instantly, Issei begins to cry out loud as Yasaka goes in for the embrace. As Issei cries in Yasaka's arms, the Fox Queen continues to hum her song. Chapter 24, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 24, Yasaka Fluff with Fluffy Tales. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. In the hot bath section of this very large dwelling, we notice a large cloud of steam. As we draw closer, we notice a large and cobblestone hot pool. Filled with green and bubbling water, the steam was clearly coming from this spot. Two inhabitants of this hot tub are currently engaged in a very loving embrace. The ruler of Kyoto and the queen of the Yukai faction, Yusaka, was currently holding the Grimori pawn, Hyodo Issei, to her chest as she hummed softly while stroking the teen's hair. Issei, I want you to close your eyes. Don't worry, era era, I won't bite you or anything. Trust me, little one. Yasaka was now looking downward as Issei was now looking upward. As their eyes met once again, Issei smiled sadly and nodded. Lowering his head and closing his eyes, Issei could feel Yasaka's many tails, wrapping around his entire body. The sensation was completely foreign to the now nervous teen but he did as he was told and kept his eyes closed. Alright, brace yourself, I am going in deep this time, era era. Yasaka was cracking a small smirk as she thought her words sounded a bit lewd. Era era, he he. Before Issei could question what this fox woman was implying, he suddenly had the physical feeling of falling. It was as if he slipped through Yasaka's embrace and was plunging into a dark and infinite fissure. Scene, Issei's inner mind. The darkness cleared and Issei is reliving the scene from when he attempted to save Asia from the clutches of Rainair. Asia, you bitch, how could you? Issei was now staring at Asia's dying body as she remained lifeless on the crucifix extraction device. Meanwhile, Rainair was standing proudly as she was transfixed on her new sacred gear. Ah, the scene changes instantly and we are back at the fountain in Kuo Park. Instantly feeling pain, Issei finds himself laying in a puddle of his own blood, one again. He looks at his hand and sees the color of crimson. It once reminded him of his master's hair color. Oh how he wishes she could have been here to save him. Issei, as he lays there, 
completely in agony while Rainer begins to take off, is only able to imagine what could have been. But at this point, it was too late, he was going to die, just like countless times before, over and over. As his consciousness slips into the void that is death, the scene changes once again. Issei, I am so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you for defeating Riser and saving me. I love you so much, my precious pawn. Issei was now high in the clouds as he was riding, with Rias Grimori on a large and winged bird. Then he remembered, right, the griffin that Sirzex prepared for our exit. Now smiling proudly as he was absolutely exhausted, Issei replies. You love me. Ellipsis dot dot, ah, Issei had to grip tightly as the griffin chose this time to dive toward a sparrow while proceeding to catch it in its hooked beak. The scene changed yet again. This time it was the orc. It was the first time Rias shattered the teen's beating heart. Issei stood where he was, however, after a few moments, his head began to lower as Rias's expression was that of something he wasn't expecting. She looked to be deep in thought, as if she were deciding what outfit she would wear for that day. Then, she smiled warmly. Issei was about to raise his head again, seeing the smile, that was until Rias began speaking. Issei, thank you so much for telling me your feelings. It means a lot, it really does. But you need to understand that I am not interested in getting with anyone right now. Now, that doesn't mean that I am not grateful for what you've done for me in my house, but, it, as Issei darts out of the orc room while his eyes threaten to explode in tears at any moment, the scene changes the moment Issei opens the door. Once again, we are in the orc. This was the moment when Rias broke Issei's heart for a second time. Issei wasn't going to dare speak about where he actually was sleeping, rather, who he was sleeping with. And he most certainly was not going to talk about Sona's exposed breast. The problem with Issei at this point in time was that he was thinking about his strange evening and early morning. These thoughts of beautiful Sona, staring at him, first thing in the morning, Issei couldn't help but begin to blush. Rias, who was ruthlessly scrutinizing Issei's body language for anything suspicious, picked up on his blushing. Pointing at Issei accusingly, Rias began to yell. I fucking knew it, you are fucking my best friend, aren't you? Issei starts shaking his head rapidly indicating that Rias was completely wrong. No, no, that's not true. Rias continues her reaming of Issei. What's this, it's not true. Oh, really now, oh, wait, let me guess, you are also fucking Seraphal too, am I right? Instantly the rest of the peerage can't believe what they are hearing. Akino was about to say something to defend a worried looking Issei, that was until Rias continued on with her rant. Hyodo Issei, of all the things that I cannot stand, it's a lying pervert who fucks my slut friends. Issei, I am going to fucking trade your ass. That's right, I've had it. Out of sight, out of mind. Finally, becoming overwhelmed, Issei dropped to the floor. This gathers the attention of his phantom peerage within his dream, as the teen's action never really happened during that specific chain of events. Rather, he stormed out of the room, but this time, he was curled up into a ball and screaming at the top of his voice. No more. Stop it. I don't want to. I should have just. Issei gets cut off as Phantom Rius's face now contorts into Rainer. That's right. You should have died. You should have died just like I asked. What's the matter, Issei? You like you've just seen a ghost. Wahahahaha. Rainer now began to rip off Rius's Kuo uniform which revealed her own black and latex S and M gear. Issei places his hands over his eyes and screams even louder. But then, instantly, his screaming was halted as a sharp pain took hold. Removing his hands and looking down, Issei was now looking at a large and red light spear, sticking out of his stomach. Instantly the boy coughed up large amounts of blood. Looking around, not one of the peerage members were looking at him, rather, they seemed to be preoccupied in small talk amongst themselves. That is enough. Issei turned his head toward what used to be the main door of the orc. Now, instead of a door, a wall or really, anything, there was only black. Standing outside of that dark void was a very large and yellow fox. It was enormous, easily the size of a multi-storied building. Everything that's happening right now completely defies physics as this mammoth beast would have easily been the size of the orc, let alone be able step inside of it. But, there it was and there he was. The phantom Rainer continued to laugh maniacally as if nothing was happening. 
The same could be said involving the peerage, still continuing on with their idle conversations. Issei turns his attention back onto the large fox, as he still lay on the floor in a bewildered panic. Seeing that this beast had nine tails, something came to mind, something felt familiar. I said, that is enough. The fox opened its large and long mouth, revealing its many dagger-like canine teeth. The phantom Rainer now turned her attention toward the voice, a very familiar voice. The fallen angel's grin now turns into a worried frown. What are you doing here? Get out. This is mine. Issei began to scoot backward against the cold floor, all the way until his back met with one of the room's walls. Then, Issei flinched while covering his eyes at what just happened. The large and yellow fox instantly reached with its massive mouth while capturing Rainer in its sharp jaws. As the fallen angel screamed in agony, the only other sounds that could be heard were that of bones being crunched. After finally hearing the end of what Issei could only describe as, the ingestion of Rainer, the teen slowly released his hands from his face. Golden fur was the only thing Issei was able to see. Clearly this beast approached him as his eyes were hidden. Slowly looking up, this giant fox with glowing blue eyes, stared back down. It then spoke while approaching even closer. I am so sorry, Issei-kun, that I forced you to relive all of that. I know it hurts, but I assure you, the pain in which you have re-endured, it will not all be for nigh. From now on, you can depend on me, to protect your weary soul. For I am a great fox spirit and I cannot allow one such as yourself to suffer any longer. Now, let us leave this terrible memory. Issei knew at once, this was Yusaka's voice. Yes it was a bit different, more beast-like and raspy, but it was her, there was no doubt about that. Issei stood and ran for her front paw and proceeded to wrap his arms around it for dear life. Completely overcome with a plethora of different emotions, all Issei could do was scream and cry into Yusaka's fur. Looking down at the broken human turned devil, Yusaka proceeded to take him to her special place. It was an area around the castle grounds that had the most peaceful presence, as it were, this was also the direct location of the intersection involving Kyoto's entire ley line system. Issei slowly released Yusaka's paw and realized he was now standing in a familiar grassy field. Still holding onto a big tuft of fur with one hand, Issei looked around this field. He then slowly began to smile, though his tears did not stop. This is that place from last night, isn't it? I like it here. The fox makes a simple nod. Lay down over here with me. All will be, well, seen, Yusaka Castle, hallways. I am not worried about anything, Tsubaki. I am sure he is just soaking in the baths and I will respect his privacy, but, I need to be sure nothing suspicious is happening. Sona adjusts her glasses while holding in a blush. Yes, but we've already verified that your sister is currently in the other room with Princess Kuno, so Serifal Sama is clearly not a threat at the moment. Tsubaki walked along Sona at a fast pace. This is true, Tsubaki, however, I fear that we may have another threat that might prove to be a challenge greater than my older sister. Lifting an eyebrow, Tsubaki replies. This threat doesn't happen to be an older and rather buxom woman by chance, does it? Sona nods with a slight hint of agitation. Yusaka-san, I don't trust her, Tsubaki. Sister's childhood friend or not, that fox queen has something up her sleeve. Tsubaki nods as she now adjusts her glasses. There's also the fact that her breasts are absolutely enormous, not even President Ramori or Akino-san could hope to compare. Sona stops walking which gets Tsubaki to do the same. Sona then looks down at her chest and begins to angrily puff her cheeks out. We, we, we're wasting time. Onward, Tsubaki. Yes, President. Tsubaki blushes a bit as the two continue their quick pace toward the bathhouse. Scene, bathhouse. As we see Yusaka continue to hold Issei against her in the hot tub, we notice her multiple tails, slowly releasing their hold. As Issei is still completely asleep, Yusaka adjusts her back against one of the water jets. She then grows a relaxing smile. Oh, this feels absolutely amazing, era era. The fox queen then looks toward her chest and at Issei. No more apparitions of your ex-lover, no more pain for you my dear, I simply will not allow anything to hurt you. Just sleep and stay within the dream I placed you in. Yusaka then breaks her gaze and looks off into the distance. I see, your saving grace arrives. Instantly, footsteps could be heard, approaching the hot tub. 
Then, through the thick wall of hot steam, we see both Sona and Tsubaki. Both girls are dressed in their evening attire. Sona then stopped about three feet from the large and hot pool. Seeing her sleeping boyfriend, cuddling up to the two things Sona feared most, this made the sea tree heiress begin to internally panic. Tsubaki also noticed this scene and proceeded to nod. She did this as she was remembering her last comment involving her breasts. Enormous, most definitely larger than the previously mentioned devils, Rias and Akino. Yasaka places a hand under her chin while she smiles brightly at the two sea tree devils. Good evening ladies, Sona Tan, Tsubaki Chan, care to join us, the water is quite nice, though, Isekun will not be responsive until early tomorrow morning. Issei was unconscious again, what the hell, what did Yasaka do to Issei? Sona's suspicion increases tenfold, what did you do to Mai, Erm, what did you do to Hyodo? Yasaka tilts her head slightly but her smile remains. Era era, I am using my fox magic to fix your lover, my dear. Sona blushes immediately. Wah, I don't know what you, erm, wait. Tsubaki speaks up. Yasaka-sama, by, fixing, Kyoto, are you implying the nightmare situation involving the fallen angel, Rainer? Yasaka slowly nods. Yes, that and some other things as well. But, let me be the one to tell you, for this one. Yasaka looks down again at the dreaming team. Sona, Tsubaki, you both have done such a kind thing for this boy. Aside from my childhood friend, you both have very large hearts. I just wanted you to know that. Yasaka now looks back at both girls, now showing watery eyes along with her usually happy, but now, sad smile. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.